see Mitch before the show. We are live, and we're talking about chords and how some people are learning to play the piano by chords. We are still here in our Chords for All series, and there are many of you who are learning as we go along and just deciding where we're going to get to a stopping place. Also, it's a Saturday. It's Saturday, and it's a mix of weather, I should say. It was so beautiful outside earlier, and now we're getting a little bit of the summer rain going on, and then I think it's going to clear up, and then tomorrow will be equally beautiful. So we're just hoping for a very nice summer for everyone. So if you're out and about, just take some cover for a moment, go do something fun, especially if you're in New York, and then come back out and and have some more fun. If you happen to be in a place where you can make some music, we always encourage you to make the best music you can make. But you're right here on C Major Before the Show, and we are talking about chords and some of the chords that you can use to play even some of your favorite classical tunes. So we have a lot to share on this podcast episode. We'll be back in just one moment. For the show, I'm your host, C Major Porter. So just bear with me today because I have a lot on my brain today. I'm thinking about so many different things. I was able to work with some of my students today, and then as I'm reading over this history book, a lot of thoughts are starting to flow from that. So I'm just thinking, how can I pull this all together to help you? But let's start with what we shared in our promo. And by the way, the promos I know seem to be a little closer to the airtime for the podcast themselves, but we're still trying to gauge when would be the best time to share the promo. Would you prefer to hear it earlier in the week, or would you prefer to hear it right before we actually plan to go on, like the day before or something like that? Everyone's so busy, and they're out and about for the summer. Lots of travelers and, and other things going on with you all, and the holiday is coming up. So... I don't know. We're just going to play it by ear. We'll just go along as we feel, and we try to really bring you our best here. So Saturdays in the summer, I think we're going to stick with Saturdays. And then if we get to a point where it feels like we should post some other things during the week, then just look out for those, and we'll try to give you a heads up on when we're going to post those. But it seems that we are settling for some laid-back topics for our podcast over the next next few weeks of the summer so we want you to sit back and relax and we are rounding out the chords for all series we're trying to get to that point where we are talking about chords that you find in classical music we also want to maybe go to the piano today I think and play some of those tunes and see if you recognize those And I don't know quite for sure if we're going to go to the internet today, but we may send you there. That would be your homework to see if you can find those tunes. I think I'll do it like that. You know our homework. That's our homework sound. And so if we send you there, I will post it as well on our blog so you can see how to navigate the things that we're talking about that we want you to share. Another thing that's happening, too, we are starting to get into another poll and we had talked about a social media poll I think on this podcast first and then we introduced one over at the C Major Radio Show by the way see us after today's show so we're going to go directly over there we want to put the shows back to back and that was the original intent that C Major before the show would come before the C Major Radio Show 
So I hope you've been following us, you've been joining us, and you might be wondering at this point too, what is the approach? How is C major approaching all of this? Well, I think I want to approach it from a growth standpoint. I mean, some people are curious about the way that things are done and the way things are said, but I really think for me it all is in in the name of growth, in the name of trying to flourish and and do something fresh and and exciting and to go along with my students as they do the same thing they're embarking on these new ideas new territory for music making maybe they used to play an instrument before and now they're just coming to the piano or maybe they're just trying music for the first time but it all feels fresh it all feels fun it feels like they're trying to flourish feels like they're trying to grow, and I support that. So what's the other alternative, I guess, would be to just to stay where you are and say, you know what, I'm not going to try anything new. I think I'm just going to stay put, and I think that I will not learn anything new. I will just take my life one day at a time and not even try. That, to me, seems like an alternative, and and some people offer that. They know, you know what? My life is fine. I'm just going to go along with the way things are and not really put any real effort to do anything new. I don't want to go to the edge of anything. Just stay right here in my little circle and let things continue to come to me. Um, So I don't know what your approach is, but let us know. So this poll that I was talking about is... Post it over at C Major Before the Show on our Facebook page. So what we're trying to do is just give you a way to interact with us here on the podcast using your smartphone, using your other mobile devices as we go along. And so I think over the next few weeks, I'm going to try to see if I can set that up ahead of time so that you know to expect that. But take a look at the link and see what you think. If you want more information, see us after the show. We'll be happy to tell you. And then don't forget that we are trying to do the same thing over at the C Major radio show. So I have a question for you. Have you tried to play classical music? Have you ever just turned on some recording of classical music, whether it was online or whether it was in your car or if you happen to be out and hearing classical music in a concert and it sounded good to you and you really thought, you know what, this could be a favorite tune of mine. I wonder how it's done. How would you play something like that? Just think about it for a moment. I think that It seems to me that a lot of music that's played on the piano may or may not translate well enough to be played on the piano. And then you have some piano songs that, of course, they're intended for a piano, but then they may not work for the pianist depending on the pianist's skills. So if you have a certain technical level that you're on, or that you're operating at, then it may be easier for you to play one song over another song. I hope you follow what I'm saying. It's also interesting. Again, I just want to bring up that one student who is interested in tiered learning. And I had another student that was interested in the same thing, but I didn't really know what to call it until I ran into another student who wanted to learn in the same way. But this student seems to be a little bit more successful with tiered learning because he already plays an instrument. So it's very interesting to bring to the table so many ways that people are learning to play the piano. So imagine you are trying to play your favorite classical tunes on the piano by chords first and then learn to play the melodies over time because you already know the melodies. You can hum, you can whistle the melodies, you can sing the melodies if you have a nice singing voice. And then wouldn't it be something though just to learn 
by chords. So one of my favorite things to do sometimes with my students, especially if they've been away from music for a while and they want to come back to it, but they just don't know which capacity they want to come back in. And then I just teach them a little something about chords. And I say, you know what? Maybe you haven't learned this way, but try it. And then they're always so intrigued to know that you can learn a song just by chord changes alone. And then the fun part for them is to try to guess what that song is based on the chord changes. And then when you tell them, they're just so delighted. So to use that word, delighted, think back. We're going to take you back to the old times, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. And think about a time when everyone was delighted to learn something about music, to learn something about playing the piano. And whatever way they could do it, they were learning to do it. And I was looking in this history book, and I'm going to be really careful of how I I talk about the history because I'm not this type of historian. I, I mainly like to talk about the history of musical instruments But this is talking about in a social sense of what's going on. So I'm going to try to talk around some of the topics and not be so direct in my language. And I hope you can follow me. But I will say, I will name some of the individuals involved and then you can get the context of it. So let's go back for a moment to, let's say, I will say this. Let's go back to, if you, if you are a history buff, you may be annoyed <laughs> with how I'm bringing this up, but please, just know I'm not at your level when it comes to history. But the Harlem Renaissance, for instance. So we're talking about a time that's post-World War I. And you have so many things that are going on socially and in the world and, and so many organizations reacting to what's going on. And, and so just the attitudes and the mood of it all, you know. But just think about in New York, the nation's business, the cultural, the intellectual center, and particularly in Harlem. Just think about what was going on musically, that you had writers and poets and painters and musicians all join together and just think about what they might have been doing at that time. And just think about the music that they were turning to for whatever reason. And and think about the music of Dvorak, if you happen to know that composer. And think about how composers were using music of that time. And think about the dances that were going on. And think about the harmonies that were going on. And think about all the different types of music like blues and spirituals and jazz and classical music, everything mixed there all together. And then think about the concert artists that were starting to emerge during that time and some of the music that was being composed and some of the programs and some of the recitals that were going on during that time. So I hope that gives you some idea. And then just start to think about what was going on around the turn of the century, the 20th century, that in 1914 there were awards that were given for anyone who, who wanted to have some sort of high achievement in, in the field of humanities. And, and think about in the 1920s that musicians were given scholarships that there were workshops and seminars for even professional musicians and and then all these works were being performed and and there were very wealthy businessmen donating sums of money for prizes to be given to composers to compete in in contests and so forth and just imagine all of this is going on and, and we're still not even past the 20s and then now we're getting to the 20s and the 30s where you have musicians and you have composers and at the same time it was very difficult even then for them to launch their careers no matter how well qualified they were 
And then yet, by the 40s, you have some of the most highly paid concert artists here in the United States and, and, and how they were having to knock on the doors of publishing houses and, and leading music organizations to, to help them with their music making. Just think about all of that and think about how we were just starting for the first time to hear about major symphony orchestras and, and the works that they were performing and major opera companies and singers that were used in leading roles in opera and, and symphony orchestras that were choosing their conductors and, and radio orchestras. And think about the people that were writing those scores for all of those movie films and think about the dramas and the ballet productions on Broadway. And then think about the artists that were receiving their recognition for their achievements, some of the composers. Think about who would be getting those commissions to write the works and gain opportunities for performances. And, and think about all of the talent that was present. And think about who was given those fellowships for further study. And think about who would be graduating from the nation's top conservatories and who were able to study abroad. Think about those. And think about the ones who were struggling to get their careers even started in music. And think about some of the obstacles that they must have faced for whatever reason. We're not pointing toward any particular reason, but just think about the attitude of the nation towards the arts. That gives you something to think about. It gave you a lot to think about. So think about all of that. We're going to play some music for you just a few moments so you can digest all of that. I know I need to take some time to digest that. And then we're going to come back and talk about some of the simple classics that we will go over in today's podcast. here on C Major before the show. We're just sitting and we're just digesting some of this history that we've been talking about because I want to put it all together so that you can really start to think about who would be interested if you weren't one of those top musicians that we, we spoke about in the history of that time. If you were just somebody just wondering, what about the wonders of a piano? Can I just sit down and just play like a simple tune? You know, what about those folks? And and how easy would they find it to play a tune? And then here's the interesting part to me. When you start looking at some of the commercial ways to, to learn to play, that there are individuals learning to play by color. And they were learning to play by chords, and they were learning to play simple melodies. I mean, that's how it, it went. That's how the advertising was to say, you can sit right down at your piano 
and play any songs you know. And even though you can't read a note, all musical terms have been eliminated. So to me, it just seems like such an educational divide. You know, when you start to think, okay, on this one side, you have people that say, don't teach me anything about musical terms. I don't want to learn anything about history. I don't want to learn, learn anything about literacy. Just teach me the basics. I don't want to re- learn to read music. Just put this colored keyboard chart in front of me and let me learn to play that way. And then anyone else who wants to learn a different way, then that's you. So that's just so interesting to me, you know. So what we're going to try to do is just tie it together in some way. This is not a perfect presentation by any means, but it's just thinking about all of that. These are the kinds of things I'd love to talk about over a cup of coffee, believe it or not. And so the number one thing you really need to have if you're going to sit down and play an instrument, and I try to really say this to my students, please, whatever you do, have some good light in the room. You know, it's really tough to play piano in the dark when you can't really see what you're doing. And especially if you're going to follow a a color chart, if you can follow a color chart. So, Okay, some of the songs. Just think about the composers. Now, I'm going to say Chopin's name the way everybody says Chopin. Chopin. But if you care to not pronounce the N so much, Chopin, you can do that. So Frederick Chopin, or Frederick Chopin, was, believe it or not, one of these composers that everyone was hoping to learn to play, just be able to sit down and just play his melody or play the chords, at least. So I haven't practiced any of this. This is all new to me. I'm going to see if I can step to the piano and just basically sight read this and, and and see what happens because there are no tone values at all. Time values, excuse me. There are no time values at all. It's just everything is color-coded. And I don't even have the chart in front of me. I'm just looking at the bare basics and then try to make some music out of it. Because, you know, as you learn to become a better teacher, you realize, okay, a lot of this has nothing to do with rhythm. It's just notes on the page, but it doesn't teach you really how to make the music come alive. There's something called an undantino by a composer I had never heard of, but I'm going to play it, see if I can play that. They have something by Tchaikovsky. They have something by Rubinstein. And then Massenet. And I have said this on a previous broadcast. I just don't think I went into detail. List. One of my favorite musician. It's not even a joke. It's just the humor that you share. If you go to a music store, you may see something called a shopping list. But it's... It's printed with the composer's last name, L-A-S-Z-T. Liebestrom, which I think was very popular at one point. And then you have Wagner, which he's known for, of course, the bridal course, which was considered a simple classic during the time and something that people wanted to be able to sit down and play, according to this source. So I'm going to step away now from our music. And then we're going to come back, and then we're just going to talk about what was going on in the general state of music in the nation around the time that all of this was happening with these type of publications, believe it or not. Okay, so just bear with me today. It's all very interesting. You are listening to C Major Before the Show. And then don't forget to tune in to the C Major Radio Show because we do talk about writing down music, what this looks like on a staff. So I think what I'll do is just maybe give you the start to some of the melodies so you can write them on a staff and then just just maybe give you some harmonies to use and maybe you can write those down or maybe go by Roman numerals or write them down as, as chord symbols using letters just for study purposes. Okay, so you're going to hear some walking and some stepping away right now. Also, 
by the way, if you happen to hear some sounds of wind in the background, it's just because we're trying to stay cool. It is summer time now, so we're just trying to stay cool and comfortable, but don't let that distract you. So, okay, I'm going to step away now. Let's see if we can get to our instrument, and then I'll come back. So as I'm stepping away, I really hope you had a very interesting week in terms of your own music making, that you were able to either listen to some interesting music or watch maybe an award show. This seems to be very popular nowadays. And maybe get out to even listen to a DJ spin some of your favorite records. So here we are in a different area. And let me tell you, the air has definitely changed over here. Okay. So, again, this has not been rehearsed. So just bear with me. seems like I know this particular uh, piece by Chopin, but it seems that they've reduced it to just a simple melody that you can play by, by chords and by color. So I just played a little bit of it. I didn't know what the rhythm was, and there's no indication of time values. You just see dots on a page, and then you're just expected to either know the tune or... Uh, or guess how the tune goes. So, it's just so interesting. Okay, so you're going to hear me say that word a lot today. Interesting. Okay, now I'm just going to play a G7 chord. So the way they've pictured it here, um, it almost looks like they want you to play it just using three notes. So you would go from like a C chord to a dominant 7 and then back to so, start off with the dominant seventh, then go to the C chord, or C triad, dominant seventh, C triad, triad, dominant seventh, C triad, and then you go to an A7. So, it's not really clear, because I don't have the chart in front of me, how they want you to play that. Okay, so I'm just playing with all four notes, because we talked about seven chords in one of our recent broadcasts. I'm sorry, a D minor, like a D minor 7, minor 7. You may have heard me say minor 7, but you're supposed to say minor 7. Okay, so a minor 7 chord, if you're describing it that way. But they are 7th chords. Okay, and then a G7, G7, and then back to a C. So, I don't know. Let's see. Would I play it this way? Okay. Or would I come in with the G7 chord when I play the E? Okay. It's lined up that way. So, I think they want you to put in the G7 chord, the G7 chord with the E. And then you go to a C chord. But play the chord along with the F sharp. I wonder if that would be 
satisfying enough for someone who just said, I really have to learn to play this tune on the piano. And then I wonder what their experience was. You know, you really don't hear about that. You know, you just see the advertisement saying, easy as pie. You can sit right down to your piano and play songs you know. Or if you happen to play the organ, but we're not talking about the organ right now. You're not reading a note. You're just following colors. You're following chords and so forth. So, and then just thinking about the real score. If I looked at Chopin's music, you know, would I see these, would I really see these changes? Or is this what the editor chose for the simplified musician or the one that wanted to simply sit down and play by colors? Adults are delighted. Exploring the wonders of a piano, you'll follow, you'll find it easy to play a tune by comparing the colored notes with the chart behind the keys. So again, I'm not using a, a chart. Also, if it sounds like I'm making fun of this, I'm really not. I'm just really intrigued by it because you had top music educators that supported this type of learning. I could name some of the editors of some of the top music magazines at the time who were really the ones that were advising this sort of thing and and how you had articles that were featured in some of the the top magazines that were out at the time. So the other interesting thing too is let's say if you tried to play this first the first four first times you're trying to play a Chopin prelude a Chopin prelude how how long do you think it would take you to do that to play something like this? Believe it or not, they actually gave you an average playing time. That was less than 20 minutes. So you should be able to get through, you know, the whole entire song. If you have the chart in front of you, following the chord changes, following the melodies, being able to read up and down. There are no arrows. There's nothing. It's just color. And you have a staff, a treble staff for the melody for the right hand. And then you see some of the notes that are indicated for a sharp key or for a black key. That's even interesting the way they say it because it's almost like it implies that black keys are all black keys are sharps. But again, I just wonder who was able to sit down and do something like this. And when we're talking about, again, think about what was going on in New York at the time. And, and how many musicians were flourishing, how many amateur musicians were able to play the songs that they know they knew and loved, and how many professional musicians uh, were were going on to do what they loved. So chords in the left hand, and that's just how they did it. Now, what concerns me is the way, the timing of that. It's like, okay. See, it's just so, and would I play the G7 chord that way or G7 chord that way, or would I play it with two notes? Okay, they're showing me three. And some of the method books nowadays, you would just see that you can just play two notes, especially in the younger and the methods for younger learners because their hand placement would be more comfortable by playing two notes together. For G7 chord as opposed to three notes. So that's interesting. So I think that's also why they gave this this method or this they advertise this book for adults. But they also say children love love it. So I wonder if some of the adjustments were way were made for children who have the smaller hand hand positioning. And and so how would they accommodate something like that? Okay, here we go. Remember, play the melody alone. That the colored circles are for the right hand and the right end of the keyboard. And then you just play those a couple of times before adding the chord. So this average playing time, which is supposed to take you less than 20 minutes, I wonder if that was the first time you tried to play it with just the right hand alone before adding the chords or once you've added the chords. It's so interesting. It, for the first time of trying to play something like this, it's going to take you less than 20 minutes. But guess what? By the second time, you should be able to play this in less than five minutes. 
And then the third time that you try to play it, you should be able to play it less than three minutes. That's really, really interesting. Okay. And then you can co- you can go and look up the song itself if you recognize the melody. Now that we have Apple Music and, and Spotify and all of those music services that may or may not have have as many classical pieces on online as they might have had if we had iTunes and Apple Music and Spotify back in the 1940s and 50s. So, spring song. Okay, I'm going to try to play just the melody to this and just see what happens. Okay, so just playing that without any type of rhythm at all, just playing everything as just a quarter note and and not thinking about, okay, where are the time values? I would really have to know that song to really know how it goes. But now that I've heard the melody line, I can think... can kind of figure that out because immediately what comes to my mind is what you used to hear as background music and some of the cartoons that you heard like Bugs Bunny and Looney Tunes and all of that so there's always some sort of cartoon character or situation associated with this type of music in my mind and so let's hear what the harmony is sound like the D7 chord again, D7 chord, let's see how they, let's see again, I don't know how they are, okay, so I just did my G7 chord with the two, with the three notes instead of the four, I said it that way, so am I done with the seven, seven chord, okay, So now let's see if I can put the two together. get the, the sense of what it was now what's what's more interesting for the left hand is that they don't really give you a way to go up and down the piano so I wonder how that went would you have to get <laughs> would you have to get a piano teacher involved it to help you with that so let's see what they say about that because I know one of these books talks about you know making sure you're working with a teacher that's open-minded enough to to work with you on how you want to learn how you want to best learn but I could just see the teachers of that time wagging their fingers you're not going to learn to play this way you're going to learn to play music properly and blah 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 so yeah I don't see any indication of that in this book but I know one of the books talks about that make sure you find find a a teacher that will work with you at this level okay take your time easy does it that's another thing they're saying about this now we have a complete tune the right hand playing the melody on the upper part of the keyboard and the left hand playing the chord accompaniment on the lower be sure to play each chord along with the melody note under which it is placed the letter preceding each chord block So, is the name of the chord. Try to memorize the name of each chord as well as the colors in the chord block. 
it's easy as pie. So I guess that's one of the advantages of having a chord chart or color chart right in front of you on the piano as part of your diagrams that you could just follow that. And then, um, you know, it's different than a color than a chord chart nowadays where you just have to figure out, okay, which version am I using? So for those purposes, remember that book that we use as part of our resources? I would say use that one. Now I wonder how that compares to this and if anything has changed. So if I have a chance to today, I'm going to pull out that book. Actually, you know what? I'll pull out that book over on the C Major Radio Show. So that's incentive for you to join us over there because we'll take a look at some of the uh, the printed chords to see which chords should be used in the left hand because there's one chord source that shows you which chords to use, especially for the left hand and the bass clef to play it this way. And so it's pretty clear that's what they're directing you to do. So, um, and not that I don't have the color chart, it's just that I didn't bring it out today. So I just thought, you know, it'd be fun to kind of figure out even the, if the basic harmony sounds correct. But it doesn't sound necessarily how the composer would have written it. So I wonder if that's just part of the ambiguous learning of it all, if that's just what some arranger thought would be easier to teach. Because suppose Chopin use use other harmonies that would be more authentic to the original score of this. And there may be a different key. So if you saw over at C Major's Classroom, we posted something about learning Moonlight Sonata. So you had a chance to learn it in one key versus another versus the original key. So that's always very interesting. And I also wonder if these songs by Chopin and by Mendelssohn, if they were published in other books in a different key or if it always was the key of C. I wonder if there were other publishers that tried to that tried to avoid the key of C, and I wonder if there were other publishers that encouraged you to play this in multiple keys. So, what publications were out there that were designed for having someone play simple classics in minutes? Also, encouraged you to play those same classics by transposing them to other keys. That that would be interesting. So having good light on the keyboard is important. I happen to have a a light that I'm using, and I like to recommend lighting to my students if they're looking to do something like this. Let's see if we could just do one more. There's something called Song of the Volga Boatman, and um, or Boatman, and I remember that song. I do. Let's see if we can skip to, oh, you know what? Let's go to Dvorak. He's uh... okay now. If I just play this straight, and again, it's in the key of C. Okay. If I just play it straight that way, and I didn't know the melody, I may not really know how the rhythm is supposed to go. But if you've heard the rhythm and you've heard the tune, you should know it goes more like this. of the left hand is supposed to be this. Okay, so again, there's no real indication on this on this page if you're supposed to use an inverted F triad, for instance? Would it be easier? I wonder if the person learning from this book would say, okay, now I need a teacher to show me if I should be playing these these triads and these chords a little closer together or if I should just play everything in root position. So that's also interesting. So let's just see here. Finish 
try to see if I can harmonize the melody based on what I see. if it's an option and it seems here you know you could probably because that chord chart gives you just a color for the letter e and if you're not reading music you don't know the e that's pictured here on the treble on the treble staff should be played nearest middle c or if you would just use the color chart and just play it an octave higher you could do that so let's see Okay, also, there's no real indication of how fast it should go. That's the other fascinating thing about this. But it is called Largo. So if you know anything about Largo and that performance direction, if you have a music dictionary, you can look it up and see. So for any musician who studied the musical terms, that it would be apparent what you're supposed to do with the melody. But I wonder, if you didn't know, would you try to play it faster than what's intended? You know, sometimes that happens with, with, with students that are trying to play something they're excited about. They want to play everything fast, and that's their goal, just to play everything super fast. And so I think that's enough for today, going over the simple classics. I could play the entire book of classics, but I'm not going to do that today. We'll say that for another time. Maybe we'll come back and do some other tunes, but... I'm always so interested to see what was done in history. So now, now what we're going to do, what we're going to do, we're going to change our location. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about the history of what was going on in New York and, and other places when it came to music making. So now I'm going to head to my other location. And again, see if you can... Go out and make some music. We always encourage you to make the best music you can make. And I know some of you are still deciding what that is. What does that really mean? What I really mean by that is just have fun. You know, so many of my students have been working so hard on their music making. And sometimes they forget to have fun. Or they forget that music is supposed to be fun. So we're going to put this to the side, and please join us after today's podcast episode. Join us over at the C-Major Radio Show, where we're going to talk a little bit more about how you would write down chords to harmonize these melodies that we've been playing here. And so here we are, back to our original spot. And... Let's see if I can get back to the music I was using before. Just bear with me for a moment. So we're talking about now the general state of music in the nation during the time. So we're talking about the beginning of the 20th century, and there were a lot of things that were starting to happen in terms of, of music making. There were music schools that were coming about. There were... A lot of new directions, let's say it that way, towards the establishment of national schools and 
more inclusion of international music in the United States. And that was at the end of the war. And so you just had all this musical development, just a, a, a period of extraordinary musical development, expansion. And so just think about that. Just think about what the finest music schools would have been that were established in in the East. And when we say the East, we're talking about the greater New York City area, as I like to refer to nowadays. So if we're talking about Rochester, New York, then we are talking about the Eastman School of Music. And according to this source, was an was an institution that was established in 1921. And then you had Juilliard. And let me just make sure I... I say the correct spelling of Juilliard because some people still think it's J-U-L, but it's J-U-I-L-L-I-A-R-D. So it was called Juilliard Graduate School in New York City back in 1923. And then you had the Curtis Institute, the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia, 1923. And they were opened with generous endowments that allowed them to gather the finest, what they called at the time, artist teachers from all over the world for their faculties. And then we can go on to say a little bit more about who was leading these institutions. But, I mean, there's just so many things to think about in terms of the whole progressive outlook of of music and and what was done to improve the status of of American composers during that time just think about all of that and just think about what some of the attitudes must have been you know and so to me the the whole interesting thing is and we say this a lot on this on this podcast is make the best music you can make so what was that and and what music was considered music that you should be making versus music that you could be making you know, that's always an interesting topic to me because I think you should play what your talent allows you to play. You should play what your technical development allows you to play. I think in some ways that could be said, that's your best music. But I know there's some teachers that have other ideas about that. So we can name different composers of the time. We could talk about what was going on in terms of fellowships. If you take a look at that poll, though, I did list some of the pianists that were considered to be leading pianists in the concert world. And so just think about that. So we're talking about pianists who really made their mark and I bookmarked it here pianists and other instrumentalists but here in the source it was saying you know some of the important concert pianists of the 40s of the 30s of the 50s and then I named some and and then even in the 1960s which would include Andre Watts who's one of my favorite pianists and then I used to talk with a piano friend all the time and and this piano friend would always bring up one of the other prominent pianists Natalie Hendaris and I believe that's how you say her name but in this source it just lists her as a prominent pianist but what's the difference between prominent and important I don't know so important concert pianist, and then you have prominent pianist. What's the difference? Could she be considered one of the important concert pianists of her time, of the 30s, of the 40s, of the 50s, of the 60s? And then you have a number, a number of other instrumentalists who were active in the concert world. You know, what would be their thoughts? I would love to know what their thoughts would have been would have been during that time. And also let me just point out Glenn Gould, which 
is also one of my favorite pianists to listen to. If you listen to any of the recordings that he's done, I mean, just really perfection, really. If you listen to some of the recordings, and the recordings weren't done overnight. I've heard stories of how he just spent like a year to make sure the recording was perfect. So, and you know I'm a fan of recording. I think that recording is a good thing. It does not take away from anybody's talent to record something. I think that it helps. It helps show what you're able to do on the piano. And then, of course, if you're able to replicate that live, then may it be so, may it be so. Just replicate that live and do your best with it. Or you may decide to make it more exciting live. But I think a recording is a recording is a recording is a recording. And then you strive to make it the best that you can make it, depending on your budget, of course. And then you put it out and you hope somebody responds favorably favorably to it. And then it is what it is. So nowadays, we just have so many things at our fingertips. So just imagine you have a keyboard now that you can record on yourself. It doesn't have to be a professional recording. It can be, it can be something just for reference to share with your friends and family. You have something you can use to record on, on your computer. You can record using your phones now, any mobile devices, and the sky is the limit with your music making. And I think the times of trying to be famous based on a recording, I think those times are coming to a close. I don't really think anybody's really trying to do that. As they have said over and over and over for the music industry, the, the playing field is starting to be leveled. And, and not everybody's going to be a superstar, but should that really be the goal at this point with with so many different ways to to make music I would just say make the best music you can make and just leave it up to your talent I would say or maybe the relationships that you build based on your talent based on your goals based on what you want to do with your music making and then just let that be it but you can also choose to share music with others that's what I'm finding to be really 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 fun is to be able to share music with my students that want to learn a little bit more about what they can do with their with their piano skills and to challenge themselves beyond what they've ever imagined to do so with with saying all of that I'm just going to close out today's show by just reiterating, make the best music you can make. And I hope you will spend Saturdays with us here on C Major Before the Show. Don't forget to join us over at the C Major Radio Show. We are going to keep going with our Chords for All series as we wind down things over the summer and then come back really, really strong with a brand new series as we go along across the summer and into the fall So believe it or not, we're only about two months away before we're talking about September and getting ready for school and fall, but let's try to enjoy the summer the best way that we can. Thank you for joining me today, and we hope to see you on our next episode right here on C Major Before the Show.